Thank you. Um, this has been a really great day and really a lot of great, uh, great content and discussion. It was, uh, uh, in some ways it was hard to, uh, the content was so great, it was really hard to not be there in person to be able to jump up and ask questions uh, and, and turn to your neighbor and start talking. But I do appreciate all the channels that, uh, uh, that Urban, Urbanism Next has provided for us to, to kind of speak to each other. I think, especially after Tamika's presentation, um, this is kind of a great way to end. I, a, a lot of things that uh, that Karen talked about also really involve um, uh, cities stepping up uh, to try to uh, move into the breach to get better outcomes, right? Uh, I think everyone was dissatisfied with the outcomes we were getting from our transportation systems. And I think in the US, we should be more dissatisfied than anyone. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is a, a uh, next slide is a series of uh, of, uh, of uh, steps that uh, that have served me uh, pretty well uh, in my time as uh, uh, leading a national smart growth movement, as the planning director in D.C., uh, even uh, when I was um, uh, when I was uh, uh, responsible in the Obama administration for responding to. Uh, to, to federal disasters. So I think that, um, that the important thing uh, for us to think about, everyone here is, uh, uh, everyone came to this conference because uh, in part, um, uh, folks are, are wanting to, to change, right? They want, um, they want to see uh, different uh, outcomes. They want safer streets. Um, they want uh, transportation systems that are uh, better served, uh, that better serve people who, uh, who have the fewest options. Um, they want to have, um, uh, they want to have uh, uh, more affordability, uh, more access to, uh, to opportunity. Uh, they, want, uh, they want these things out of, their, uh, out of their transportation systems, out of their communities. Um, so what I would say is, um, uh, you know whether uh, uh, whether you want um, uh, those things or you want some other things, um, you have to realize that you you play a role in it as a change maker. Uh, you know that might mean starting to lead the change yourself, but uh, but a lot of our issues in our communities actually take uh, concerted action from a lot of different sorts of people. So I'm going to walk you through this this. Uh, uh, a set of steps that might be useful for you in thinking about uh, what uh, what happens uh, next, how you would take uh, some of the things that have uh, come about because of COVID and make them permanent, uh, how you uh, how you uh, change some of the uh, the fundamental uh, underpinnings of our decision making, uh, as Tamika suggested, to make sure that we get better outcomes. So the first thing that you would need to do honestly, is, is uh, communicate a sense of urgency. Um, if the thing you want to do is easy, it would have already been done. And people need to know what, um, what the urgency is in order to act. We're, we're, we're mostly in our communities happy to be that frog sitting in that pot headed for a boil. Uh, sometimes people need a really strong reminder that that pot is gonna boil over. Uh, for some people um, that uh, the, the climate crisis uh, has, has given people urgency and triggered a lot of activism. Uh, you know, one example is Paris, reducing the number of cars uh, uh, that are allowed to be on streets, um, in part because transportation is responsible uh, for the largest percentage of carbon emissions, um, but also because uh, transportation emissions uh, are growing while all the other sectors are, are shrinking. Um, the, the next slide. Um, the, for other people, um, and we've heard a ton of talk about this today, um, you know, what, is, what has really been uh, concerning us is uh, this, the, the incredible impacts of this pandemic uh, and, it, and, the, and the, the recognition of both the fragility of our public transit and our transportation system overall uh, with, with uh, demand declines, the capacity implications of social distancing, but how these people that were calling critical workers during the crisis are actually uh, critical and essential every day. So 
for some, the urgent question has become, how can we radically reconsider our transportation system and how it serves people? And that's really providing, I think, the urgency for a lot of us who've tuned in today. Um, this gets to some of the discussion we've heard uh, before, that any one entity acting um, is, is, uh, is, is going to act in a narrow self-interest. If we can come together around a set of values um, uh, and, and broadly be working together toward a common goal, uh, that's an important way to manage change because urgency is only the start. Things that need changing um, you know, need a lot of people to be acting. Uh, if many of you are planners, and I think you have a sense that uh, you, you know, your plans aren't self-implementing. Um, and the more people you get involved in the planning process, the more people who buy in uh, to the plan and what it's trying to achieve, the more likely those plans are to be implemented. And, and there's a reason a heck of a lot of plans and communities sit on shelves. It's because they don't have that, uh, that group of stakeholders that, are, that, that see how things could be better for them. And just to take a page from Tamika's presentation, that set of stakeholders needs to include the people who would be better off if we changed our transportation system, for example, to be uh, more equitable, to, to provide more service, to serve people who need the transit, to serve them first. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, one of the things that I've been uh, able to do recently is work with the District of Columbia, where I was appointed to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee of a reopened DC advisory group. Um, and uh, the next slide shows that um, uh, this, is a, this is a big advisory group. It holds, uh, there's probably 20 people on every subcommittee and, and, and everyone reached out to many, many other organizations, but it covers almost every kind of function you can think of happening in a city. Um, and most of the task forces are led or co-led by people of color, as are most of the, uh, uh, of the people that are senior on the advisory group. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's broad for a reason, uh, because this um, uh, transportation affects everything else. Uh, for example, whether you have health and safety options really affects whether uh, businesses uh, would reopen or people would have the confidence to do this. Uh, but uh, education, child care, open space, social services, small businesses, vulnerable populations, these are all uh, some of the groups that are involved and, and, and some of the considerations that are uh, part of, uh, of, of this uh, reopened DC advisory group. And this kind of uh, gathering is happening all across the country, uh, probably at almost every level of government, but uh, uh, this is an opportunity to be involved in, uh, in, in something that, is, that, that could take us not back to, uh, uh, to normal, but a, a place that's better than normal. Next slide. Um, and for it think to be better than normal, it's, it's, um, you know, it's not enough to talk about what isn't working. Uh, you also have to describe the end state. What would it be like in a community if the changes you want actually happened? Paradigms can't be destroyed. They can only be uh, replaced and, and people need a compelling vision for an alternative to the status quo. Next slide. Um, 39% of the people who ride bus transit in the US are critical workers. Uh, during the COVID crisis where there was transit at all, many of these workers had to decide if they wanted to risk their lives by crowding onto buses or be stuck without a way to get to their jobs. Uh, equity and access issues are rising in every city in terms of importance. But with COVID, I think it really, uh, it has really uh, put a spotlight on how inequitable uh, some of our systems are. Minneapolis's Transportation Action Plan was drafted earlier this year, but look at how compelling their vision is uh, for, for a system that where 75% of all the residents with, would be within a five minute walk of high frequency transit and 90% within a 10 minute walk. I mean, that really says something about the kinds of outcomes you're trying to reach. Um, and, and I think that's very important. The, the, the next slide really talks about um, a vision that's more, um, that's more uh, a picture, right? Some people have a hard time imagining how the built environment could be different uh, without uh, uh, some aid to visualize. So these are visualizations that Steve Price put together uh, quite a while ago. If you advance the button, um, it, it'll show you, I hope, um, how the streetscape uh, can change. 
and maybe that won't happen. Um, but whether you do this with drawings or whether you do this with, um, with uh, 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 photographs, uh, whether you do it with, uh, uh, with simulations, like, uh, like a lot of the tactical urbanism uh, 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 incursions into cities, that it's sometimes important to be able to give people a physical sense of what things really look like. Um, so many of the changes that you saw on the last slide um, are really changes that, uh, that have to land somewhere in the built environment. Um, so I'm a big proponent of finding local uh, leaders and institutions. Um, sometimes they're elected, sometimes they're appointed, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're community leaders uh, to engage. But, but eventually you're going to have to involve local government to get some of these changes. So um, I think that uh, NUMO frequently uh, uh, engages governments like, uh, like the ones you see here. Uh, we're working with uh, Bogota, we're working with uh, Detroit, we're working with Pittsburgh, we're working with uh, Washington DC uh, and the communities there to try to uh, uh, do pilots that, that essentially demonstrate what some of these changes might look like. Uh, because as you can see on this slide, almost everything you're seeing in the picture is actually a regulatory policy or zoning change that can only happen if you're engaging local governments. It looks fine on our end. Okay. We're, we're seeing the slides progress. All right. Um, so what do you need next? How do you begin? Maybe with a catalytic project. Um, catalytic projects can change a city's perception of itself. I'm gonna use an example I'm very familiar with it, which is DC's bike share program. I think a lot of people know that we have a program Maybe, you, maybe people know it as capital bike share, but in fact, um, uh, the, the real catalytic project was not capital bike share, but a program called Smart Bike. I think by most measures, it would have to be called a, a failure. Um, uh, you know, as a, as a bike share program, it was a hundred bikes in 10 locations. Uh, it was operated by a reluctant company, an ad company who, who paid us in bike share services. We'd explain what those were instead of in money to put ads on our bus stations, our bus stops. Um, it was very, it was city only, it wasn't regional. Um, and it was really hard to get new stations installed in part because of the working with the utility. Uh, so it only operated for two years, but out of that experience, we got to know very intimately what we wanted in our next iteration, that we wanted it to be regional, we wanted it to be large, uh, we wanted it to be what we call the capital bike share, which now has 5,000 bikes at more than 500 stations uh, and, and serves our entire region. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and really provides uh, choices for a lot of people. Um, so for us, that project changed our own perceptions about ourselves. It really became a gateway drug, if you will, to biking. Uh, and it really uh, juked up our, our, uh, our biking overall and our commute, uh, our, our share of biking, our share of uh, commutes that went to biking. Um, what you have to do next is, um, you know, uh, uh, build on whatever catalytic projects you have, because it's not enough to have a single project that goes well. People who do catalytic projects are often what I would call clever exceptionalists. Uh, they break or change the rules, they manage to do amazing things, but no one else can follow them because, uh, because they don't have the perseverance, they don't have the zeal, they don't have the time or the money or the, uh, you know, the willingness to, to go through a long process, a convoluted process to try to get to do something that they want. Uh, we can't all uh, be the people that break the rules all by ourselves. We need to change the systems and the structures governing the rules to allow broad-based action. Um, one of the things that we that we see a lot of is uh, what a what a poor match our parking regulations are in cities for uh, what parking demand actually is. As Don Shoup would tell you, uh, our, our our regulations often have no basis in reality. Um, so one of the things that uh, that most cities start with is making exceptions to to parking uh, and and changing uh, whether uh, whether 
uh, projects that are near transit need to have as much parking. Uh, and they might do that over and over again, like we did in DC until finally we updated our zoning and got rid of parking minimums downtown and greatly reduced parking everywhere else. Uh, but otherwise, until we did that, we were only getting uh, people to reduce parking, even if they didn't want it, if they, if they went through a special exception process or, or were doing a PUD. Uh, but now everybody follows the same rules and we have a lot less parking being produced. That's much more of a fit to the, to the actual demand. Um, the, the, uh, my favorite example maybe in the US is, is this, um, that all, all of us want to try to get more bike lanes in our cities. And you know, we look at these construction projects going on and we, and we, and we uh, do a face plant and say, why couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, bike lanes be going into this project while they're resurfacing the roads? Uh, well, uh, the city of Cambridge basically flipped, uh, uh, flipped things on their heads and they made the thing that they wanted, bike lanes, whenever there was road construction, the rule and not the exception. Um, so uh, you know, I give them great props because I think that's what all of us would like to see that we do these things that make sense uh, as, as, the, as the default and not try to be these clever exceptionalists. Things don't change overnight in the built environment. Um, how fast they change sometimes is a function of the size of the city and how fast it's growing. Um, so, so in some ways what we need to do to give people heart during these long-term uh, efforts to change things is to figure out how to generate short-term wins and how to indicate if we are headed in the right direction you know, in the, and what's the very earliest sign. Um, in some cases, it might be um, doing something uh, like what they did here in Bogota, where they wanted to do much more delivery by cargo bike. We heard some discussion of that earlier. Uh, they, they didn't change all the rules um, right away, but what they, what they did was they uh, held a contest. They uh, put a, a, a gas powered van up against a cargo bike and they basically raced to see who could do the most deliveries, uh, you know, uh, in the fastest time with the lowest CO2 emissions and with the lowest cost. And the publicity around this competition got a lot more people, even before any changes to the rules, to opt to use electric cargo bikes for delivery. Uh, they really helped to make the case. Um, you need to consolidate your changes and build on them. The credibility uh, and the ambition of your work should increase with every win and every change and with a broader base to build on. I talked about bike share a moment earlier. Uh, when we started it in DC, we wanted it to be a national model. Uh, and even though we started our, our pitiful capital uh, smart bike program in 2008, by 2010, we had launched capital bike share. And indeed, uh, there are now more than 100 bike share programs in the US, uh, in part because uh, a lot of people got to see that bike share could work. It could be a form of public transit that would uh, grant cheaper access to a lot more people, and, and it really caught on. Um, it's important to embed the changes in the culture. Um, the bike share story for us uh, was that it really, it really changed you know, uh, the kind of city that we were. Uh, we're a city now that has uh, more than half of its trips walk, bike, and transit. We market ourselves based on walkability, bikeability, and, uh, and transit use. It, it, it really became part of the fabric of DC. Uh, we, we certainly have a lot of evidence of, of what the culture has been in terms of sprawl, in terms of celebrating cars and roads. And it gives me so much pleasure to see uh, that, uh, that, that increasingly uh, uh, figuring out where, where you can walk, where you have proximity and access, is a, is a way that a lot of people choose where their office is gonna be, their apartment is gonna be, what city they wanna live in. You know, so much so that you can get a walk score, and many people do, to figure out what's the stuff within walking distance of this place I might call home. Um, so all of this is, uh, is, is basically not, uh, not, my, not my material. Um, this is adapted from uh, the, one of the most reprinted Harvard Business Review articles of all time called Leading Change why corporate transformations fail. Um, and I discovered it um, when I was a, a federal worker at EPA, and I was already on step five with trying to change transportation and land use in, in this country. And uh, I, I didn't, I'd never even heard of, uh, of Cotter or his work, but I, I, I found it very validating uh, that, uh, that he'd done this, uh, 
that he put this together and that I was following something very like it. And I have to say, I've used it uh, in, in almost every job I've had ever since. And I actually had a chance to work with Cotter to create this playbook for the built environment uh, when I was a Loeb fellow. So I got to work with him directly, but uh, uh, it's something that was, was really useful to me. And I think everyone is talking about um, how we can uh, make uh, changes that are better and not go back to the old normal, but build a normal um, that really serves us uh, better in every way. So with that, um, I will stop. Harriet, thank you so much. Uh, definitely a lot of great information. Um, I've had a lot of conversations, you know, over the last several weeks. Um, and one, when I was, you know, really thinking about the, um, you know, the number of businesses that are likely not to make it through this pandemic. And as a land use planner, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's a lot of vacant space. We also have a lot of vacant space on our roads because there's not as many cars. And in some of these conversations, we're like, you know, what's going to go into that space? And of course, it's going to be whatever we are prioritizing at that time. Um, and it's hopefully it should be the things that are really valued by communities. Um, possibility of, you know, housing for commercial space or, you know, bike or, or um, pedestrian uh, facilities in some of that, the right of way, the street space. So for you, uh, just real quickly, what do you see as some of the key short-term wins for cities in filling some of the space that we have right now that's really going to get us, again, kind of the same question I asked Tamika, you know, to, uh, you know, to help us really achieve the communities and build the communities that we all really want to live in? So um, I'm, I'm very much informed by the effort I'm involved in uh, at the, at, at, with DC, um, but I would say that, uh, that all of the projects that we've talked about uh, today, whether they're uh, uh, bus, uh, uh, bus lanes, uh, uh, exclusive bus lanes on streets or, or widened sidewalks or uh, new bike lanes, there are lots of reasons to do it immediately, including to reduce the, uh, the speeding uh, you know, uh, narrow the design speed of the road. Um, but I also think that uh, we're having some really interesting conversations with the transit agency and all of the other mobility providers. You know, we had issues before. There were walled gardens, but with nobody behind the garden walls these days, it's a lot easier to have the conversations about what is it that, uh, that we both want, to, that we all want to do? You know, how do we provide these choices? Because there's a lot of agreement uh, you know, there's a lot of, of overlap, especially when it comes to not uh, going back to uh, the same levels of traffic congestion and the same levels of, of, uh, uh, of car use as we had before. Uh, but it's surprising how many people uh, want to be in on that conversation from major employers, um, you know, to the mobility providers, to local merchants, um, you know, and to, and to people who really worry about, you uh, you know, about the employment picture and, and job access. So I would say that, uh, that now is the time to have a big tent conversation about the kind of city that you want to be and talk about the things that, that this crisis has uncovered about what wasn't great about the old normal.